This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. All righty. Peace and blessings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We'll go ahead and get started. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala. We start in the name of God, with the name of God, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. Uh, we ask that he send his peace and his blessings upon our beloved, our messenger, uh, Muhammad. Uh, so this is Juz 11 or section 11 of the Quran. We are now in the second third of the Quran, uh, which is incredible, subhanAllah, that we've already entered into the 11th night of this month. Uh, so in this Juz, you have the ending of Surah Tawbah, which Dr. Amina had covered yesterday, and then uh, the entirety of Surah Yunus, or the chapter entitled uh, Jonah, the Prophet Yunus, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. Uh, and then just a very f- small segment of the next chapter, which we can get more into tomorrow. Uh, so focusing on the chapter Toba entitled Repentance, which ends in this section, uh, Dr. Amina spoke about how this chapter was revealed uh, after the Tabuk expedition, which was basically when uh, this was towards the end of the life of the prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, and this is when uh, there was the sort of, um, you know, uh, belief that the Byzantines were going to come and attack the Muslim community. So about an army of 30K, 30,000 strong went out. It was a long, arduous journey. There ended up being no battle, but it was still a sort of, uh, um, you know, triumph and that the power was able to be demonstrated uh, of what the Muslims had uh, in terms of being an established and solidified faith community. Um, this chapter, the ending of Toba, as does the previous portion of it, speaks a lot about uh, the hypocrites or those who are seeking to infiltrate the Muslim community from within um, for the sake of trying to acquire power, recognizing that the Muslims had established themselves, they had more clout. A lot of these folks, instead of outwardly um, you know, opposing the faith, they tried to dismantle it and disrupt it from within. And the verse or the chapter also speaks plenty to the variety of treaties that the Muslims had drawn up with other tribes and other groups in the region. Um, and it speaks to those groups that had broken those treaties and not just once, but consistently and gives the direction for the Muslims to uh, pursue those groups who now served as a threat, having broken the word that they'd given uh, initially. The thing I want to focus on here uh, is just one verse towards the end. Um, and this is where the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, is described by God Almighty, Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, Allah says in chapter 9, verse 128, a messenger has come to you from among yourselves. Your suffering distresses him. He is deeply concerned for you and full of kindness and mercy towards the believers. Um, and in this you know, verse, the Prophet وسلم, is described uh, as having qualities that are usually attributed to God, right? Ra'uf al-Rahim, that there's kindness and mercy towards the believers. Uh, and what's beautiful is that this verse Uh, demonstrates the psyche of the prophet to help showcase to the believers that the suffering that they've endured and any difficulty that they may encounter uh, that distresses and troubles the prophet, causes grief and anxiety. Um, And I think it's important for us to, you know, think about this as people who have come 1400 years after the existence of the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, even though we follow in his footsteps and the example that he set you know, we, we spend a lot of time and so much of the faith tradition uh, is, the, is the, the honor that we give to the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, but in that also, that relationship is reciprocal and that the prophet time and time again throughout his life demonstrated the concern he had, not just for the community that existed around him at the time, but for all those of his ummah, his community that would come till the end of time. There's the famous hadith where, the Prophet وسلم, he's with his companions, and this is towards the end of his life. And he says that, uh, you know, everything that I ever wished, you know, everything came to me. God granted it to me except one thing. I mean, the companions, they asked, what is that? And he said that, uh, that I'll never have the chance or the opportunity to see my brethren, referring to brothers and sisters. And the companions say, you know, aren't we your brothers? Like, aren't we your brethren here? And the Prophet says, you know, you are my friends my companions, but I'm speaking about those people who will come after me and without having ever seen me or bore witness to me will follow in my footsteps, right? That the prophet, so I some had a heart that yearned 
to meet those who follow in his footsteps, yearn to meet people like you and I, because that love was so deep for anyone who took that faith, right? Who took on the journey of submitting to the oneness of God and following in his tradition. Um, and this also reminds me of, uh, you know, the, the narrations that talk about uh, the nights, right? Where the prophet saw his son would be praying to God, reporting that uh, his beard would be full with tears and he'd be sobbing and the earth around him being uh, uh, in a state of grief as well because of the sadness of the prophet, the earth around him would also sob. And it was in these moments where the prophet would supplicate to God saying, oh, my umma, right? The concern that he had was that the people that would come after him would struggle, right? And they would strive, but they would struggle in that journey, in that path. And that would cause him grief, that he could not be there with them, with us as we traverse the same path towards the oneness of God. So that relationship is reciprocal. We send the peace and the blessings and we ask Allah to send those peace and blessings upon Muhammad. But the yearning that his heart had to meet you and I uh, uh, was extremely uh, present throughout the course of his life. So the end of Thoba, right? This is what we just covered. We now enter into the chapter entitled Jonah Surah Yunus. Um, and it's important to sort of highlight uh, the placement of the chapter Toba and then this new chapter that we're entering into. We discussed how the Surah Toba was revealed towards the end of the Prophet's life. This is, uh, you'd say, about nine years after Hijra, after he went from Mecca to Medina. And so this is towards the end of his life. The Muslim community is much stronger, much bigger. There's more stability. They're not dealing with the same types of persecution and oppression that they did when they were in the minority. Surah Yunus, on the other hand, is revealed at arguably the lowest point of the Prophet's life. This is two years uh, before Hijra, before he leaves and is uh, exiled from Mecca uh, and has to flee to Medina. So just to understand where the Prophet is when the Surah of Jonah is sent down, this is after the Prophet Sallallahu has spent about 11 years. And in those 11 years of advocating for uh, this belief in the one God for reforming the corrupt and inequitous behaviors within the society that he was present in in Mecca. It is over the course of 11 years that he has no more than, say, one to 200 followers with him. It was through these 11 years that there were three years spent in a boycott where he and his community were isolated uh, and excommunicated in a sense where no trade could happen with them and other parts of the Meccan society. It was within these 11 years that he lost his wife of 25 years who served as a source of support for him. He lost his uncle who served as a source of protection for him and who raised him when he was a child after his grandfather passed away. It was in these 11 years that he experienced the journey to Ba'if, trying to seek refuge in another city outside of Mecca for his believers and was sent out, right? Was essentially thrown out, stoned to the point where he was bleeding, where his blessed feet and his shoes were soaking with blood. It is in this period of time, after having endured all of that, right, where Surah Yunus comes down. And what's beautiful about the, the story of Jonah, right, the story where Yunus, Islam, Prophet Jonah, was sent to his people, was fed up with the arrogance of his people to the extent that he turns back on his mission towards spreading the oneness of God, ends up getting swallowed by a whale, pleads to God in the darkness of the whale, uh, in the darkness of the night, the bottom of the ocean to be saved. And God not only saves Jonah, but elevates him and brings him back to his community, all of whom then accept or have accepted the message. This story of Jonah was actually the first prophet to ever be revealed to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu as we read in a different chapter in Surah Qalam, uh, where Allah says, be, be patient with the decree of your Lord. And do not be like the companion of the whale. And at this low point in the prophet's life, He's being reminded, right, through the story of Eunice, through Jonah, that the burden that previous prophets have bore, bore in spreading the message of the oneness of God and being able to fight back the persecution that had been felt for simply advocating, right, for more equitable practices and behaviors and a fair treatment for the downtrodden and the impoverished. Uh, this is something that has occurred in the past to help assure the prophet and reassure him that this journey has been pursued by those who have come before him as well. So you'll read in this chapter, and it's, it's by far one of my most favorite chapters, one of my most favorite surahs in the Quran. It focuses on some very core 
elements, some baseline themes, right? You'll read time and time again in this chapter, Allah Azza wa Jal asserting the idea that he is the one God, the one true creator, that there are no partners with him that can be ascribed to him. He asserts the reality that the hereafter is where the true reward uh, for the suffering and the patience endured in this life will be given. He affirms and, and, and emphasizes uh, um, the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, the prophet sorry, son of, uh, uh, is, is true, right? And honest in his message. And that each of the actions the believers take, not one instance or one moment of those actions will be laid to waste. Everything will be accounted for. So just to go through a few verses in the chapter of Jonah, Yunus alayhi salam, Allah says in the fourth verse of this chapter, it is to him you shall all return. That is a true promise from God. And I think sometimes when we're approaching the Quran, we're trying to approach the faith tradition. We're trying to make sense uh, of what it is that we want to be doing to better our souls and our relationship with God. There is that reminder that ultimately all of this is a true promise from God, right? This is the true promise. And you have to think about this is being stated not only for the believers at that time, but for the prophet, sorry, some to be reshared as well, that through all the suffering he's endured, that conviction exists and remains, that the promise of God is true as to what is to come, as to the relief, the aid, uh, the support that God will provide through these moments of difficulty. In describing those who arrogantly chose to disregard and, and disbelieve in the message after knowing the truth, Allah describes those people. And he says about them in verses seven and eight, those who do not expect to meet us, who do not anticipate or look forward to meeting us and are pleased with the life of this world, contenting themselves with it and paying no heed to our signs shall have the fire for their home because of what they used to do, right? And again, right? If there's anyone who can keep it 100, it's Allah Azza wa Jal in making the statements clear that for the hearts that fully knew and were exposed to uh, and acquainted with the truth, right? And then sought to turn away. And in this verse, Allah describes that they are those people who don't anticipate, look forward to, right? Expect to meet their creator. And, you know, I was once talking to um, a friend who, you know, basically framed their life in two different ways, right? They said, here are my professional and personal goals, working up in their career, schooling, all of that. Uh, and then here is a parallel ladder of my spiritual goals and ambitions. And I thought subhanAllah was so beautiful that when we're thinking about what we wanna to strive to accomplish in this life, that everything doesn't simply exist for the material success, right? Granted there is barakah and blessing in that as well, that it's not a bad thing inherently, but that there's also a focus on the spiritual goals of improving one's relationship with prayer, deepening the relationship with the Quran, carving out more time within one's livelihood and extra time to be a means of service and good to others. Because Allah says that there are those people who are simply pleased with the life of this world. There are no ambitions beyond the realm of this universe. And how limited does our soul become when we simply seek to succeed in this life without thinking that our soul could become anything or any uh, or achieve any greater station, uh, you know, beyond just how this world would define us in terms of our material. You know, Allah then constantly emphasizes uh, these depictions of the hereafter. And I think for us as well, especially in this month, really deepening uh, our belief in the reality of the hereafter helps then shape and inform and influence the, the, the way in which we, per, uh, you know, carry out uh, not only ourselves, but carry forth our actions. Allah says regarding the hereafter in verse 45, on the day he gathers them together, it will be as if they have stayed in the world no longer than a single hour. Those who denied the meeting with God will be the losers for they did not follow the right guidance. SubhanAllah, what's crazy here is Allah describes this period, this life, as if it would feel that no longer than a single hour had passed. You know, I am living, alhamdulillah, uh, with my uh, grandparents right now, my Dadija and my grandmother. She is 88 years old. Uh, and even when I speak to her about parts of her life from before, and of course with, uh, you know, uh, dementia and, and certain mental difficulties she's faced, there's a lot she's forgotten. But in general, just asking her, you know, like, does it feel like you've lived 88 years of your life in this world? And she's like, no, it just, it just feels like it just happened, right? That I just suddenly got here. 
And that's also something that the warning has been there from the beginning, that this life will pass by so quickly before you can capture it, right? Because that is the essence of the transience of this world. Uh, and, and on that note, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal says that for every soul that has done evil, if it possessed all that is on the earth in the hereafter, that soul would gladly offer it as a ransom when it sees the punishment. God will not accept it. The way they forgot God in this life, God will forget them. This is verse 54. And I, I want to end on this is time and time again. And this is through various parts of the Quran. God describes how the people, when they see the repercussions of their actions in this life, in the hereafter, and the consequences, the punishment that they have to bear, they will try to ransom all of the wealth of this world, right? To say, here, take this. And God will, will not accept it, right? And this also shows the scales with which God is judging our actions, that the material could be uh, uh, in the infinitude of amount. But if the actions were corrupt to begin with, if we knowingly with the truth then pursued uh, unjust and corrupt actions and behaviors that we knew would be detrimental to ourselves and thus to those around us as well, then the wealth of this world will mean nothing, right? Because those actions and the quality of those actions bear the truest of weight and value in the eyes of God. In the last line where he says in verse 54, the way they forgot God in this life, God will forget them. We ask that Allah protects us from ever being amongst those who forget the presence of our creator. Because in this chapter you'll read, there's no specific mention uh, uh, of establishing the prayer or that uh, you know one needs to do X, Y, and Z in building the relationship with the creator. This is baseline elemental themes of Islam that you in simply forgetting your creator right? What does that do to the soul? What does that do in terms of your existence in this world? Um, and so I'd just like to end on that note. Uh, Jazakallah khair, barakallah fikum. Assalamualaikum, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu salam ala ashraf mersani, wa bashrah li sadli, wa salli amri, wa halal uqdatan min lisani, wa qawli, wa qawli, in the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and prayer and wisdom and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So today we're covering juz number 12, which means that we finished 11 days of Ramadan, subhanallah. May Allah accept all of our good deeds this month and continue to fill the month with barakah. So chapter just number 12 is just a couple of ayahs into Surah Hud, and we'll cover, cover all of the surah essentially except for the first five ayat. And then it's the first half of Surah Yusuf. And it's a really beautiful means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to bring comfort to the Prophet وسلم, when things were difficult was actually through stories. And Surah Yunus, Surah Hud, and Surah Yusuf are, they all begin with Alif Lam Ra. And, and it's kind of, it links the two, three surahs together as a means of just healing for the Prophet. Sallam. And it always astonishes me when Muslims are anti art, when the Quran itself is actually using stories to bring solace to the Prophet. Sallam. And the, the, so between Surah Hud and Surah Yusuf, the, the tone of the story is very different. In Surah Hud, there was a moment where the, someone went to the Prophet وسلم, and, and a series of Sahaba went to the Prophet وسلم, and they say, Shibta ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of Allah, you have white hair. And he had 14 white hairs. SubhanAllah, Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiallahu actually counted them. So we know that there, he had 14 white hairs. And he said, Shayyabatni Hud. The, the, the chapter in the Quran, Surah Hud, actually made, gave me white hair. And he said, Hud and, and her sisters, a series of other surahs and their Hud, Waqi'a, Ida Shamsuku Wirat, sorry, Al Mursalat, Wa'amma Sa'nun, Ida Shamsuku Wirat. And Wallahu Alam, part of the reason that they had such an impact on the Prophet وسلم, that they literally turned his hair white is that it had some of the descriptions of the Day of Judgment, had some of the descriptions of what happened to the people before. People that prophets and unfortunately didn't didn't accept the prophets and surah hud is probably one of the most intense in terms of its descriptions of the people before it comes it mentions a number of things subhanallah it, it meant and and part of the reason it's revealed that this time the prophet وسلم, at this point is in mecca and every time he tells them something they argue with him and he tells them, look, look at the, the greatness that Allah gave you. And they're like, no, no, we did this. And he says, Allah can punish you. And they're like, well, then where is it? Why didn't Allah punish us already? And he 
And they like in, in ayah number 12, they're like, but why didn't he, why doesn't he have treasures? Because it, it doesn't say anything about the Prophet ﷺ. Instead, it says about what they value. Where they're saying he's not rich enough to be our Prophet. Just such an insane thing. SubhanAllah. It really just goes to show that the impact of materialism has on them. Or that they're like, oh, why, why, is it, why isn't there an angel walking around? And then in another surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually answered this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that if you were angels walking around on the earth, I would have sent you an angel. I, Allah sent you a human being because you're a human being. That's kind of the point. They're supposed to model things for you. In, in Surah 2, there's one of the challenges that the Quran set up for the, for the Arabs at the time. It says, if you disbelieve in this Quran, then come with 10 surahs. And that's mentioned in ayah number 13. And in other points, it says, then come up with one surah. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept lowering the standards for the challenge and still they were never able to meet it. Because apart from the meanings of the Qur'an being miraculous, the linguistics of the Qur'an are also miraculous and the way that it touches people's hearts. SubhanAllah. Um, the, uh, the Qur'an, before it begins the stories, it actually compares the people who can see and those who can't see. And it says um, in ayah number 23, it's one of the descriptions it has here of those who believe, the believers, those who believe and do good works. And it says they are calm with their Lord. And I feel like this whole Ramadan, we've been talking about dua. And dua is, doesn't necessarily need to be, Ya Allah, I need this, or a narrated dua from the Prophet or from any other Prophet or from the Quran itself. That moment of calm, just sitting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the most important dot you're probably going to ever make. May Allah grant us that to all of us. And the, the next ayah actually compares people that do that versus people that don't is the difference between someone who can see and someone who can't see. Someone who can hear and someone who can't hear. SubhanAllah. May Allah allow us all to see with our hearts and hear with our hearts. And then it starts to get into the story of Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam. So part of the reason Surah Tud is so significant is Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam is mentioned in other surahs. This was the most detail that had been given up until that point of the story of Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam. And, and it, his message is simple, worship only Allah. And I'm trying to protect you from a day to come. SubhanAllah. I remember having a conversation with a woman. Um, so it was interesting. Her husband was a minister. And she was saying, like, I don't believe in heaven and hell. I believe they're a place in your mind. And I was like, well, that's kind of a deal breaker for Muslims. <laughs> like, <laughs> the day of judgment is, is a significant part of our belief system. It's a required belief. And then there was a point a week later where she was talking about there's so much injustice in the world. And one day will God make it right? And that's when it dawned on me. And I was like, yes, one day God will make it right. That is the day of judgment. There's a designated day where everything is being held to account. SubhanAllah. So when the prophets are telling people, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most people don't have a problem with the theology of Islam, they have a problem with holding themselves to account. Even as Muslims, we really, really struggle with this, of keeping ourselves accountable. And then of course, because he's telling people to be held accountable, it is the elites of his society that first start turning on him. And his critic their criticism of him is they're saying that there are people that we have designated to not be worthy that you keep telling them they're worthy. And he says, I'm not going to kick out the believers because you don't like them. And I can't tell them that Allah will never give them anything good. Like, I'm just not going to do that. SubhanAllah. And I just found it so ironic that that's what they were, they were angry with him about. And finally, when they got so frustrated, they said, if like, let your Lord bring on this punishment that you're talking about. May Allah protect us. We know that Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam, if you think you were patient through activism or patient through learning something or patient through your worship or whatever it is, Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam lived for 950 years. And his people stopped believing in him and he still had to live among them. And he would, he's building a, a huge ship in a place that doesn't have any water. And they would walk past him and they'd mock him. This was not easy, alayhi salam, subhanAllah, what, what he endured. But nothing was more painful than the moment where he realized his son refused to get on the boat with him. And he kept calling out to his son. And this is probably one of the most dramatic like, scenes in the Qur'an that really just hurt your heart. 
he calls out to his son and the Quran is describing, he's saying there's mountains of water between them. And he tells him, come join us. And he says, no, I'm going to go to the to a mountaintop. And he tells him the mountaintop's not going to protect you today. Come with me. And they get separated by the water and his son drowns. And you can imagine the amount of personal pain that Nuh is going through. It's his job to warn people. And even his son didn't take his own advice. And he goes and he complains to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's telling him, Ya Allah, I'm in pain. This one hurt me. And essentially Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's response to him is like, you don't get to guide who you want. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides who he wills. And I just, any time we have, this is an unfortunate trend that I think in, happens in our Muslim community, is when, I don't know, when, when someone commits a sin, their parents cut them off. How do you think they're going to come back? When the main source of love that they are given in their life is your parents and they're cutting you off. May Allah protect us from that. If your child is sinning, love them back to Allah. Not just your child, everyone in our community. Why do we think that we can push people away and that'll ma magically fix them. Love people back to Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah. Then comes the story of Sayyidina Hud alayhi salam of which the surah is mentioned and his people were named Qawm Ad. And Ad and Thamud in particular are mentioned often in succession in the Quran because the, the Arabs at the time of the Prophet sallam, when they traveled north and south they used to pass by, their, by the ruins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send them a reminder of like, you see these people, they were more powerful than you. And they didn't learn the lessons. Why aren't you learning the lessons? So it mentions the story of Ad and Thamud. It briefly mentions the story of um, the angels visiting Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, going to Lut alayhi salam, going to Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. And every time the story is told in this surah, it's actually told from the perspective of the Prophet themselves. And again, this was a reconciliation for the Prophet ﷺ. It also mentions the story of Sha'ib I realize that I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to get go this go through this faster. In one of the other hadith, when they asked the Prophet ﷺ, why why do you have white hair? He mentioned ayah number one twelve, where it tells him, "So be upright as you have been commanded." Being upright and being consistent is one of the most difficult things for us as human beings. And the Prophet ﷺ, it was directed directly at him and he's carrying the weight of the ummah on his shoulders. And he's saying just the weight of it is what had turned his, his hair white. The next ayah says, don't even start to incline even a little bit to those who, who, who are oppressors. Because this is how what leads to the fire. Don't even lean towards the oppressors a little bit. Keep the lines clear of what is oppressive and do not go anywhere near it. I'm going to end with ayah number 120 so we can talk about surah, surah, um, the next surah a little bit. Uh, it says, and we uh, in ayah 120, it says, and we tell you the stories of these prophets so that we can calm your heart. And in it has you have been given the truth and a reminder. And 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 strong and a warning and advice for the for the believers. Subhanallah. Surah Yusuf is um, has the exact opposite effect. Subhanallah. So Surah Yusuf, they tell you that if you are depressed, if you're struggling to recite Surah Yusuf, we don't have a lot of time to get into it. So so inshallah, we'll cover more of it tomorrow. But it's just such a rich story with a very happy ending, and part of it is to give us calm. And to like, you can see how at every point in his life, it's not the most difficult time in his life where he's being betrayed. You do talk about those, but you always see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him from one difficulty through another and lifted him up. And if you're ever going through sadness, listen to Surah Yusuf, recite Surah Yusuf, read the translation of Surah Yusuf. It's, it's a beautiful surah. Jazakumullah khayran. In the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So um, Afraz will be taking a few days off. His nani, may Allah have mercy on her, just passed away in India. Please keep her and his mom in your dua as they go through this time. And may Allah have mercy on everyone who's, subhanAllah, his years this past year has been tragic, alhamdulillah. May Allah allow us to get through it, except from us, our fasting and all of our good deeds. I mean, 
Um, so today we're reciting, inshallah, chapter num juz number 13. So we're covering the second half of Surah Yusuf. We're covering Surah Al-Rad and Surah Ibrahim. So Surah Yusuf, the second, uh, we, we talked about it a little bit yesterday. Surah Yusuf is what you read when when you your spirits need to be lifted up. SubhanAllah. And it was a means of the Prophet, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it as a means to console the Prophet. And at the beginning of the Surah, it says, we have sent you the the best of stories and even all the way at the end of this of surah yusuf it again ends with saying that in this their stories is are lessons for those who have intellect so the stories in the quran and and not just stories in the quran stories in general we hear stories and, and there's different art forms that capture people's lives and they're there for us to learn from them subhanallah i just I think Surah Yusuf is, is probably one of my favorite surahs in the Quran, and it just it has all the intrigue and the betrayal and, and all of the ups and downs that you would expect from a story, but at the same time, you and you see it coming full circle, but you also see Sayyidina Yusuf salam maintaining his integrity to the utmost his entire life. And it starts off with him having a dream of 12, 12 planets and the sun and the moon prostrating to him. And, and he tells his father, who's also a prophet, and he tells him about his dream and his father is worried about him. He's trying to protect him because he knows there are people that might intend evil for him. And sure enough, it was his siblings that felt jealous of how close Yusuf السلام, was to his, to his their father and they threw him in a well. And he ends up enslaved in a different land. But subhanAllah, and, it, and at every turn, every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him a difficulty, he also gives him ease. So he ends up in the house of, of, um, of a nobleman who is actually a financial advisor to the king. And he ends up learning so much from him. However, when he gets older, the, the, king's, the, sorry, the, the nobleman's wife finds him extremely attractive. And she, try, she literally tries to sexually assault him. And when he runs away, she blames him for it. And this is like a subhanAllah for everyone that's ever survived anything like this. Yusuf alayhi salam is an example of a, a victim who was blamed and who was actually imprisoned because of it. And he was imprisoned because of it. And there's two men that came to him and they tell him we had these dreams and Allah gifted him the ability to interpret dreams. And he tells them the interpretation of their dreams. And even when he's in prison, he's doing da'wah with them. And there are a lot of incredible projects in this Muslim community. And there are a lot of incredible leaders that I personally know, and also in, in, in history, probably Malcolm X, may Allah have mercy on him, and Hajj Malik Shabazz being the greatest example of this, of someone who was, who just, this was the time that they were able to actually connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like learn and study and, and intellectually grow. And this is why we talk about these stories feeding people's intellects, subhanAllah. So he's imprisoned. Allah allows him to come out of prison because the king has a dream. And the only person that knows how to interpret dreams, one of the men that he spoke to in jail, he's like, I know someone that knows how to interpret dreams. So they reach out to Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam. He clears his name. And then he is put in power over, he asks to be put in power over, um, the, the like essentially controlling the finances of, of the kingdom to make sure that they don't, they don't actually that they can survive the drought that is coming that they saw in the, the king saw in his dream and he does exactly that subhanallah his family comes back because there's a drought and they need help and they are the power that is helping the surrounding communities his his brothers come back and he knows them but they don't know him and it's interesting because sometimes we don't always understand the impact we have on people and it's such a gift when someone actually tells you the impact that you have on them. And if you hurt someone, apologize. And just try to do better next time, subhanAllah. He sees his siblings and it becomes a means of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing his father to come back. And his siblings all end up coming to Egypt and living there. And then and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially, he forgives his brothers. And I just, every time I struggled with forgiveness, I, there was a, a scholar that, mentioned this story and he's saying you've never experienced a betrayal like this these were his actual siblings and they did this to him and he still found a way to forgive them subhanallah may allah have mercy on sayyidina yusuf alayhi salam also in the meantime as you're going through his story you also see the struggle of his father 
who literally cried himself so much that he, he actually went blind just over the loss over his son. SubhanAllah. The love of a parent is very, very real. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted him his eyesight back and he come, he joins his son in Egypt, subhanAllah. And then the story of, of Bani Israel, it, those are the, the, Bani Israel are actually the children of Yaqub alayhi salam. So essentially Yusuf's siblings alayhi salam. Those are the 12 tribes of Israel. They end up in Egypt and they end up staying there for about 400 years until the time of Musa alayhi salam. Of course, there's a regime change. Things change so significantly. And by the time of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, that they become oppressed. But that was the one prophet handing off to another prophet, subhanAllah. So that's Surat Yusuf. Surat al-Ra'd is, it, it's literally called the thunder. And it's like that on purpose. Because Surat al-Ra'd is supposed to hit you hard. And it's, there's so many points in the surah where it shows you the difference between truth and falsehood, subhanAllah. In this surah, in, in ayah number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, similar to what we had mentioned before in surah al-anfal, Allah again repeats this concept of Allah doesn't change what is within a people until they change what is within themselves. If we want oppression in our society to end, we need to stop being oppressors. And all of all of the, the bad things become magnified, but also all the good becomes magnified. I, I remember having a conversation with someone where, where he's like, you work so hard and all it takes is like one person to, to, to commit a horrible act and they end up ruining the name of Islam. And I just smiled and looked at him and I told him, I don't think the good that I do goes to nothing. And if you believe that, I don't believe that. Alhamdulillah. And I just... One in ayah number 17, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually directly gives this example. And it says that you you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that brought down from the heavens water. And the water moved the mountains and it created these rivers and created these valleys. The water, the, the revelation actually physically changes things. But it also says that on top of the water is this foam. And the foam is essentially it's an air bubble. But it looks so big. And it covers the water. So that's one example. And then the other example in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that you take metal ore and you put it in the fire. And again, there's this foam that comes out of the fire. It's all the impurities bubbling out. They're getting burned off. And what you're left with is, is, is iron or, or, or gold or whatever the metal you were trying to get out. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for the foam, it, it is falsehood and it goes to nothing. And what's beneficial for people, that's what stays in the earth. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives people examples. And they're both such vivid images, subhanAllah. I feel like a lot of the times we always, it, there's a lot of noise. And there's always like, if you get caught up in the drama of who's doing what, you can feel hopeless because you look at it and look so big. But the reality is if the masjid has drama, sure, it might have drama. How many people come and pray? How many people support each other? How many people help each other? And it's telling you what is actually beneficial for people to see it for what it is. You can't see the foam on top of the ocean because of all the waves and forget that there's an entire ocean underneath. May Allah keep us focused on what's actually true and what's actually there. There's an ayah number... Um, 13, and I think this is probably the most terrifying ayah in this surah, where it's saying that they debate about Allah. And he has a lot of strength. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't punish us for every mistake, not because he is incapable of it, billah, but it's because he is just that forgiving. And he's giving us more time. And it's saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even, even the thunder, praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels out of awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he sends thunderbolts and he, can, and he can hit with it whoever he wills. And here they are arguing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despite his might, subhanAllah. Ayah number 15, and as I'm reciting, inshallah, we'll take like a 30 second break to do a sajda. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, he's saying everything in the heavens and the earth prostrates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether willingly or unwillingly. So when we recite the ayah, inshallah, we will willingly do sajda for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then we'll continue the recitation. Ayah number 28, it says, again, another beautiful ayah, it says, those who believe their hearts find tranquility in the remembrance of Allah. It's with the remembrance of Allah that the, high, that the hearts feel find tranquility, subhanAllah. 
but it's only because we are willing to receive it. In ayah number 31, it's talking about the disbelievers when they were talking to the Prophet ﷺ and they kept saying, why, don't you, why doesn't this Qur'an, why doesn't it move mountains? Why doesn't it move the earth? So they missed the point. They missed the guidance that was in it. May Allah protect us from that. I wanted to, I wanted to end with ayah number 41. And it says, do they not see that we take the earth and we, 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 we decrease it from its edges? One of the effects of global warming is that because the sea level, like the sea levels are rising, the edges of the earth are starting to come in inwards. And then there's another ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Destruction has appeared in land and in sea because of what people's hands have brought. The sea levels because of climate change have actually been the, the pH of the ocean. The fact that human beings can even change the pH of the ocean is such a shocking thing, subhanAllah. But it's because of people's greed. May Allah protect us from it. SubhanAllah. Surah Ibrahim, Surah Ibrahim is, is a beautiful surah. In the same way that Surah Al-Rad is talking about the difference between truth and falsehood, Surah Ibrahim is talking about the difference between the believers and the disbelievers, those who carry the truth and those who don't. The, the word kafir in Arabic, it actually so, means someone that covers something up. So it's not someone that doesn't know. It's someone who knows the truth and is insisting on hiding it. SubhanAllah, may Allah protect us. It starts off and it says, that it tells the Prophet Sallallahu that this book allows, um, Allah sent it to you so that you will be able to help people come out of darkness into the light. And that is the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number four says, we have not sent a people, a messenger, except with the tongue of their people. And part of our responsibility in terms of da'wah is literally to speak the tongue of the people. It's not just a language, it's also a culture. And you can see in lots of the previous surahs that we mentioned in Surah Hud, every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say, we sent to this, this tribe, we sent to these people, their brother, this prophet. Their brother, this prophet. He was one of them. As was the Prophet ﷺ, one of the Arabs, and he is not just the leader of the Ummah, but he's one of the Ummah. And he loves us as such because he, like, subhanAllah, he speaks directly to our humanity. In ayah number seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you are grateful, I will increase you. And if you, wala in kafartum, because here kuf, dis, disbelief is actually equated with a lack of gratitude. If you are grateful, I will increase you. But if you are ungrateful, that Allah will punish you. And when we think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increasing us when we are grateful, when you thank someone for something that they are good at, Allah gives them more of it. They become better at what they do. So it also applies to people. But this is Allah, the same way that we accept the laws of gravity, of like if you throw something up, it'll come down back to the earth. Accept this as Allah. If you are grateful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase you. May Allah increase us all. Ayah number 21 is actually kind of scary where those who are vulnerable and oppressed in a society go to those who are empowered on the day of judgment and say, say we followed you, but you misled us. And the reason we, I mention this is because it's so important whether you are vulnerable in society or empowered in society, still who you are is your relationship with Allah. And yes, we fight for social justice, but we never see ourselves as anything less than our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the dignity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. So being vulnerable in a society doesn't mean that we don't also have a task at hand. Our task at hand is to see ourselves as valuable as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us. And it's similar to the shaitan, what he says in the very next ayah, where he says, when everything's said and done, he's saying, I didn't have power over you. I suggested and you did. That's not my fault. I, I have no power over you. And you see how may Allah protect us on the day of judgment. The people are, end up being divided. I know I know it's at the half hour, so I will try to wrap it up. Um, just maybe the last thing I want to mention is ayah number 24, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the example of a good word is like a, is like a strong tree. It has deep roots and then it keeps giving fruit. Tell people nice words. It's not just, a, it is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it is also enacting the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ that he sent us with. And then the opposite example is, is a bad word that is like a weed. It has no roots. 
May Allah protect us from it, subhanAllah. I, I didn't get to the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. The, the, part, the part about Ibrahim alayhi salam, the thing to focus on is try to focus on the du'as that he made. At ayah number 37 is him making du'a for essentially the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Ayah number 40, he asks, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted him all of his du'as, he continues to make du'a and he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him one of those who are upright for the prayer and from his children. SubhanAllah. The, uh, the surah ends with ayah number 52. It says this is a reminder for people so they can take heed and they can know that there is only one God and so that the people of intellect will be able to remember. My apologies for going over. Jazakum Allah khayna. Assalamualaikum. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. 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 Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi and they're essentially, it's essentially two surahs, Surah Al-Hajj, Surah number 15, and Surah Al-Nahl, which is number 16. Um, surah Al-Hajj is really, really interesting. So the, the Hajj is actually the name of the city where the people of Thamud used to live. So we mentioned that they, they got mentioned in the last few surahs about um, their Prophet Sayyidina Salih alayhi, alayhi salam was, was doing da'wah with them, but they were very, very powerful people. And... I can share my screen a second. I can show you how and why they are were as powerful as they were. So when the Quran describes them, it talks about how they used to build these houses in the middle of the, there, there's, when you see, if you see images of Petra, what they did is they carved homes into the mountains. And Thamud, when the, when the Quran describes them, it says, those who brought the rocks into the valley. So this was their city. And if you can see this image, it's a really fascinating image. And you can just, there's, there's a man walking just for perspective of how large these homes were. And to, to say that they were powerful people is, is, is an understatement. They were extremely powerful, which is part of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them in the surah. So the surah was again, and it, this was, it was revealed in Mecca and it was to console the Prophet Sallallahu at a very difficult time. And it was to console the Prophet Sallallahu at a time when from a worldly means, it seemed like he didn't have, like people had power over him. And Quraysh was extremely powerful. And despite him being from Quraysh, Quraysh was utilizing all of its resources against him. So one of the things that they did is they organized their, their media machine against him. There was a man by the name of Walid ibn Mughira and his, his point of arrogance against the Prophet ﷺ, there's different people that fought the Prophet ﷺ for different reasons. Abu Jahl, when they asked him, Abu Jahl is, I mean, he was known as the father of wisdom. And then because the Muslims won, he has now went down in history as the father of ignorance. So him and Abu Sufyan and a third man who used to go at night and they used to sit outside of the house of the Prophet ﷺ to listen to the Quran. And they used to love the Quran when the, the Fajr, when Fajr, when, <laughs> when the sun would come up, they'd run into each other and be like, what are you doing? He's like, what are you doing? And at the time, they were all fighting the Prophet Sallallahu And they're like, yeah, we won't come back tomorrow. And then the next day, they do the same thing. And then the, the, the second day, they're like, what are you doing here? You said you weren't coming back. And just the, the Quran was just so incredibly beautiful. And then the third day when they ran into each other, like, really, we can't come back. <laughs> like, we can't be fighting him during the day. And if we get caught listening to him at night, like, it's just going to completely discredit everything that we're doing. And one of the three men, actually two of the three men became Muslim. Abu Sufyan much later became Muslim during the conquest of Mecca. But the other companion, I'm, I'm blanking out on his name, but he went to Abu Jahl and he asked him, he's like, if you like this man's message, why are, why are you fighting him? And he says, our, our, our two tribes were like the two horses and we'd always compete like this. And sometimes they'd overtake and we'd overtake. And now they have a prophet. How is our tribe ever going to win? And literally that was the reason that he decided to fight the Prophet And Walid ibn al-Mughira, when he decided to fight the Prophet that even the Quran at a different point describes it and says, why did, was the Quran not revealed to one of the two noble men of Arabia? He was one of the two most powerful men in the Arabian Peninsula, and he just felt indignant. Why should the Prophet ﷺ be the Prophet and not him? 
because again, he associated his power, his his resources, his his social status is the reason that he should have been the one that was chosen. And the fact that he wasn't the one that was chosen meant that he was going to dedicate his life to fighting in the Prophet ﷺ. And he would gather meetings and they would come up with ways to, to say, what do we say about this Quran to stop people from listening to it? And there are a lot of narrations of things that would happen. Tufayl ibn Amr, he was a companion. And, and when he first entered Mecca, he was coming to Hajj. And anytime someone interacted the, with the Prophet ﷺ, there was, there was a, a, a probability that they might actually become Muslim. So they went to Tufayl ibn Amr and they realized how powerful he is in his tribe. And they're like, this man, he has this magic, these magic words and you listen to them and it turns family against family. And he's like, what is this? And he stuffed his ears with cotton. And he's in Mecca and at some point it dawns on him like, wait, that's the dumbest thing in the world. And then he goes straight to the Prophet and he tells him, what are you saying? Recite this to me. And he listens to the Quran and he becomes Muslim. So there are a lot of things that were like this, but Essentially, Mecca had turned its resources against the Prophet ﷺ. And there were key people that had, had done this to the Prophet ﷺ. And it, there's a point where it becomes overwhelming because the Prophet ﷺ is trying to get the word out and they're trying to create noise around him. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah is telling the Prophet ﷺ, you have nothing to worry about. And one of the ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number nine, it says, inna nahnu nazalna dhikru innahu, inna lahu lahafilun. We're the ones that revealed this to you and we're going to protect it. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is powerful, then you actually have nothing to worry about. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the people of people before, like the people of Thamud, the, whose picture we saw, they were incredibly powerful people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu even despite their power, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won over them. So you have nothing to worry about and is calming the Prophet ﷺ down. And there's a very significant um, ayah that comes at the end in ayah number 94. It commands the Prophet ﷺ to stand up and proclaim the message. It says, Fasda bima So stand up with what you have been commanded and stay and and just turn away from the disbelievers. Inna we will take care of those who mock you. And we mentioned Abu Jah, he was called the father of wisdom, but because he went against the Prophet ﷺ, he went down in history as the father of ignorance. Another fun example of that is um, Al-Malik Numrud, the king Numrud, who went against Sayyidina Ibrahim ﷺ, and he was a king. Abu Jah was the leader of, of Quraysh, and yet he went down in history. His name is Nimrod. His name is literally equivalent to idiot. Because that's what happens when you go against the people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the creator of the universe is on the, their side. And the, the Quran is calming the Prophet sallam, and telling him that there's going to be a conclusion to what you see. And, the, and it, again, is consoling the Prophet sallam, and is telling him, we know that you would you feel constricted in your heart because of what they say. We know it bothers you. And again, it's a very physical description. And the response that the Quran tells him is, bihamdi rabbik. So, so glorify the name, the, the by, glorify the praises of your Lord, and be one of those who prostrate. And in the next surah, there's actually a sajda, kind of like what we did yesterday, where we pause in the recitation to, to do a sajda. And worship your Lord until certainty comes to you. And certainty in this moment means death. Allah alam. The next surah, Surah al Nahl. One of the other names of the surah is Surah Al-Na'am, the surah of the blessings. So in, in Surah Al-Hijr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing the Prophet sallam, yes, human, it, it can seem that what human hands have built is very powerful, but what human hands have built, human hands can change by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change it. So in Surah Al-Nahl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again repeats a concept that we mentioned yesterday and an ayah that we mentioned yesterday, that Allah doesn't change what is within a people until they change what is within themselves. Yesterday when we recited it, it was in the sense that if, if there's evil, you have to change to good so that you can change your situation and change your condition. And Surah Al-Nahl is actually mentioned in the opposite, where if you're following the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will maintain his blessings with you as long as you don't disbelieve in the blessings. SubhanAllah. So, and it mentions in the surah, there's so many examples where it talks about um, the different colors of animals. It talks about how we find uh, warmth in the animals. 
We use animal hides. The animals, we, they used to use these um, animals to carry th their heavy weights from one place to another and allows to them to arrive to places that they wouldn't have ever been, that it would have taken so much more, been so much more difficult to arrive to. The camels that would carry them through the desert. And it mentions like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought from the heavens water and they, and they have, they can drink the water, but they also, it grows trees and they sit under the shade of the trees. And from the trees, they get all these, this different greenery, they get um, olives, they get, date palms, they get grapes, they get from all of these different fruits. One of my friends, one of her reflections is every fruit at some point was a flower. When you're eating fruit, you're literally eating beauty. SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation is so incredible. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a number of blessings. In ayah number 18, he says, If you count the single blessing of Allah, you will not be able to contain it. And every every gratitude, like every discussion I've had from every interfaith community, regardless, they'd always say keep a gratitude journal. I know very few people that actually have gratitude journals. But even if you don't actually have a journal, sit at night and just reflect on the blessings of your day. The fact that we are all here together means that Allah blessed us with with internet. Allah blessed us with a common language. Allah blessed us with the ability to comprehend. Allah blessed us with so many different things. And we didn't even begin talking about the blessing of the Quran itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with so much. Take one single blessing and look at everything around it and you will just get lost in the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's kind of the point of the surah. And in, in, I know we don't have a lot of time. Ayah number 49 and 50 is where we will do a sajda. So we'll, we'll make sure that we stop there. But the ayah, the surah actually gets uh, its name from the ayah uh, about the the bees. So ayah number sixty eight, or it says, "And your Lord revealed to the to the bees that take make homes in the mountains and from the trees and from what they build, and eat from the fruits that of your Lord, and go through the paths of, that Allah subhanahu wa taala has facilitated for, for you, and out of its stomach comes this." comes this drink that is of different colors that in it is a cure for people and in that is a sign for those who reflect the bees have no idea the health benefits and the healing benefits in its honey it's just going through the path of its lord and i i, I know i don't have a lot of time but i had a i have a really good friend of mine Part of the way that we met is we ran we ran into each other in the street. This is I'd for, just moved to a new city. I didn't know anyone, and Ramadan was starting, and I was getting really anxious. Of like, I I don't want to be I don't want to, to be the only one fasting. I felt like I was the only Muslim in the world because I didn't know anyone. Subhanallah. And my husband and I would eat like box mac and cheese <laughs> for a flood instead of having huge family dinners. And I, I I ran into her in the street, and that just a woman smiled to me in the street, so I smiled back. And subhanAllah, she ran up to me and she got excited. And she's like, hey, are you new here? Like we saw Arabic writing in your car. We thought you might be Muslim. And I got really excited and I asked her if she's Muslim too. She said, yes. And I realized now I have a Muslim neighbor and I was over the moon excited. And subhanAllah, a month later, she came to me and she told me, I have to tell you something. I have actually been like when during her college year, she had been surrounded by Muslims the entire time, but she wasn't actually Muslim. And part, actually, subhanAllah, speaking of weird race relations in America, it's because she was a light-skinned black woman. The white women told her she wasn't white enough. The black women told her she wasn't black enough. And the Muslims just didn't care what she looked like. They're like, she keeps showing up to stuff. She just became a part of our community, and that was that. And subhanAllah, she said, when you asked me if I'm Muslim, and I answered so naturally that, yes, I am, I decided if I feel like a Muslim, I might as well be Muslim. And she called her friend and took her shahada on the phone that day. And she's telling me the story, and I'm melting. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to smile to everybody in the street just in case. But every time I reflect on that story, that was a gift that Allah told me about her story. I really, really hope that we come the day of judgment, just having followed the path of our Lord, just done everything that, we, that he asked us to do. And you show up with mountains of good that you didn't even imagine. You didn't even know. You could have smiled to someone at the, in the street, changed their lives, and had no idea. 
And you show up on the day of judgment and be like, hey, this person did all of this good because you smiled at them. SubhanAllah. And there's so many systems in Islam that are like this. I know a lot of us are paying zakat during this month. Zakat has such a fundamental impact where it balances out society, where, where, where it decreases the wealth gap. Because anyone that has money that they're not spending is now forced to give zakat. You spend it, not just, even if you're not spending necessarily in charity, but you're just moving the economy. As long as you're not hoarding money, if you hoard money, the zakat is there to purify you. And this is why, subhanAllah, despite all of the struggles that you see in a lot of Muslim societies, zakat becomes a balance. It's something that is consistency balancing society. It's a spiritual act for us. But the benefit that comes from simply following the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can, they're endless. It's 6.30, so, sorry, it's 9.30, your time, 6.30, my time. So I want to make sure I stop for the reflections. Jazakallah khair, assalamualaikum. Lord of mercy, the of mercy and prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad It's good to see everyone. Um, we're covering another juz today. We are juz number 15. So juz number 15 is two surahs, surahs number 17 and 18, which are Surah Al-Isra and Surah al -Kah. Surah Al-Isra was revealed towards the end of the time of the Prophet in Mecca, and it's commemorating, it begins off commemorating uh, a very important incident that happened towards the end of the Prophet Sallallahu time in Mecca. And it's um, the night journey that he had, and this is what the surah is named after. After, what's really beautiful is that Surah Al-Isra begins by glorifying Allah and saying, Subhana Ladi, glory be to the one. And um, Surah Al-Kahf begins with, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah, the one that, uh, um, we'll get to Surah Al-Kahf, the, the one that revealed to his servant. But I just thought it was beautiful how the two of them began with things that we say regularly just to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah literally means to float above something. So sabaha means to, to swim or to float. And subhan is an extreme version of that. So anything you can think of, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above that. And alhamdulillah is, is an all-encompassing word of praise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserving of praise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us things that we should be grateful for. It's a, oh, it's a combination. And of course, we know the name of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu has the same root word. So I just thought that was just a beautiful subtlety between the surahs and how they relate to each other. But Surah Al-Isra begins by talking about the night journey. And the Isra and the Mi'raj, we, Wallahu alam, there's a difference of opinion, <clears throat> excuse me, about exactly when it was. But, and the narrations about it are very long, so we can't talk about them for an extended period of time. But the Prophet ﷺ, some of his descriptions is that he was saying in, he was in Mecca. There's another narration that says he was at his cousin Umhan at his house, and he left her house, and then he was sleeping near the Kaaba. And Allah Adam that he was in that semicircle that is right next to the Kaaba, is actually part of the Kaaba. And Jibreel salam woke him up, and they went on this journey, and they rode an animal that is halfway between a horse and a mule. And this horse used this this animal called the buraq, and it has the same root word as lightning because it was traveling at the speed of light that it would put its hoof at the extent of the horizon. And he said, never was there like any whiplash that <laughs> so fast, but always him and Jibril were always at the same level. And they get to what is now modern what, what is now Quds. And it was, again, one of the places where prophets had been for a long, long time. So when you walk around Quds, you're actually walking on the footsteps of so many different prophets. And he gets there and he prays, he ties the buraq, and there's a masjid there called Masjid al-Buraq, where, and Allah knows best where he tied this animal. And he met all of the prophets since the beginning of time, and he led them in prayer. And he communicated with them, and he asked them about their challenges, and then he ascended through the seven heavens. The story of the Mi'raj, his ascension, is mentioned in other surahs, but in this surah, the, the night journey is what's mentioned. And as he's meeting all of the prophets, we know that our prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad is, is, is the conclusion, the culmination of all of these prophets. And, every, and each of those prophets was sent to a specific group of people to a specific time. And our prophet, Muhammad is the universal prophet. 
and some of the struggles they went through, he asked them, he, he asked them for, for just advice and what to do and how, how to do things, like how to do things and how to heal his own pain. For example, he asked Zakaria alayhi salam, what did you do when they took your son? And they killed your son. The Prophet sallam, lost a son when he was young and it, part of it is foreshadowing. He ended up losing almost actually lost all of his children, his adult children in, in his time in Medina, except for Fatima radiallahu she was the only one that outlived him. So there's a lot of just beauty in him conversing with the prophets and him becoming the culmination of all of, all of prophethood is now in one human being. The other thing that I think is really significant about the surah, because it was towards the end of the Meccan period, it is almost a transition for the Prophet ﷺ himself from the Meccan phase to the Medinan phase. He also met the pro some prophets that were empowered. Like in the surah, it mentions Prophet Dawood, peace be upon him, who is King David. Some of the prophets were in power and some of the prophets never had political power. And some of them had it or didn't have it at different point, points in their life. One of the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ is it's not just that he gave us an example of what to do when you are empowered and when you're not, when you have wealth and when you don't. Like he, show, he showed us an example of what to do in every situation that you can come up with. But also the fact that he was in power towards the end of his life means that the Muslims were in a position to, to protect his message and to protect the Qur'an. The Qur'an was written within the first year of the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. It was compiled and the entire community had agreed on it. Agreed on the message of the Prophet ﷺ and there's a lot of power in that. Another name for Surah Surah Al-Isra is actually Surah Bani Israel, the, the, the Surah of the children of, of Israel. Because what's really fascinating about them is the majority of the time when the Qur'an is discussing them, it's discussing their relationship with Prophet Musa, peace be upon him, and how they were oppressed in the land and they were forced to leave. And now it's talking about them when they were actually empowered later. And it begins the surah by telling Bani Israel, the children of, uh, of Israel, that, uh, that you will rise to power twice. And it's part of it is foreshadowing for the Prophet ﷺ, but also telling him, learn from the lessons of the people before. What happens when you have power? How do you conduct yourself? And another consistent theme in the surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is consistently telling, commanding both the Prophet ﷺ and us to be moderate. For example, it says, do not keep your hand stuck to your neck. You're being so stingy that you won't spend a thing. And don't do the exact opposite where your hand is completely open and you can't save a thing. Be moderate in your spending. Be moderate in what you're doing. And, and the signs of the universe that Allah mentions in the surah, for example, mentions the night and day. The one that gave you the night will also give you the day. The one that carried you through the entire Meccan phase with the Qur'an will continue to carry you through later in the Medinan phase. And this is, for example, towards the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, tells the Prophet we, we revealed this Qur'an to you over time. And it will come over time. And it gives the Prophet a specific du'a that I think is a beautiful du'a for anyone that's in transition is ayah number 80 that it says, Ya Allah, allow me to enter with truth and allow me to leave with truth and give me from you a, cl a clear victory, clear authority, subhanAllah. And also it says that in, in the, this Qur'an that we have revealed in it is a healing for people and it is a mercy for the believers, subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 70 mentions the dignity that Allah gave all of Bani Adam, all of the children of Adam. And it briefly mentions the story of Adam alayhi salam with, with Satan and how he hated him for what he looked like. Because again, it's trying to protect the Muslim community from the prejudice that might seep into it. In ayah number 53, and I think this is really important for us as a Muslim community to remember, it says, tell my servants to say what is best. The shaitan will try to tear them apart. The shaitan has clearly been a clear enemy for, for people. The shaitan is not going to people that are already in the middle of a fight. He's going to people that are in harmony. And it's saying, always use your best words so that people can't misconstrue things of like, oh, but did you really mean this? 
Say good words, strengthen your relationships with people and we should strengthen our relationships with each other through saying good, kind things to each other as often as we can. It also is a reminder of, in ayah number 23, any parent who is listening will, will, will be very upset if I don't mention this ayah. Ayah number 23, it says that Allah has decreed that you do not worship anyone except him and that you treat your parents well. And if they... If they reach an old age, one of them or both of them, then do not, do not, do not put them down. Don't say oof. Don't be like Ugh, to them, and say a good kind word to them. Seeing your parents get older is a very difficult test that I don't think other things prepare you for. It's one of the hardest things about becoming an adult is seeing your 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 parents as human beings, and seeing how how they did their best. And to overlook their faults as much as we humanly possibly can. And, and this is, of course, this is for good parents. We're not talking about abusive parents. May Allah protect us. And alhamdulillah, the vast majority of people have good parents that just simply love them. SubhanAllah. I want to mention the last thing I, I want to mention in the surah is ayah number 18 because and 19. Because I think these are some of the most important ones. It says, whoever wants this fleeting life, we will give them whatever we will for whoever we desire, based on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. And then they will be sent to the fire, may Allah protect us, and they will be humiliated. And whoever wants the next life, وَسَعَلَهَا سَعَيَهَا And put in it for, put forth its effort. Put forth the effort for the next life. And they are a believer they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will be grateful for their efforts. What we need to succeed is simply to want the next life. And if we truly want it, it'll manifest in everything that we're doing. We talked about this before in terms of Allah not changing what is within a people until they change what is within themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, if you want to do good, it will manifest. Use good words. You do all of these. Do as much as you can. But if you want love, it will show. SubhanAllah. May Allah make us all from, all from those who, are, who succeed in this life and the next. Then we get into Surah Al-Kahf. And Surah Al-Kahf is long. So I, I forgot to mention Surah Al-Isra. The Prophet Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu said the Prophet وسلم, used to recite it almost every night. Because it was a reminder for him while he was in power of what lessons he needed to make sure he, would, he, he paid attention to regularly. Surah Al-Kahf, it is recommended for us to read it every every week on Fridays. Any surah that you are recommended to read often, it's because there's a depth to the surah that simply cannot be captured in a 15-minute reflection, <laughs> let alone in every single week. There's still so much depth to the surah. But there's a significant couple of things that happened. The, the disbelievers sent some two of their leaders to the, the Jewish rabbis. And they asked them, they said, you are a people of the book. And this man claims to be a prophet, prophet like the prophets you mentioned. What should we ask him? And they said, ask him three questions. And if he answers them, then he's telling the truth. Ask him about young people who went and stayed in a cave. Ask him about a man who traveled and conquered the world. And ask them about the truth, about the spirit. So the spirit is addressed in Surah al um, Surah Al-Isra that we just finished, and it says, and they ask you about the spirit, it is from the affairs of your Lord. But the story of the people of the cave and the story of, um, sorry, I'm blanking out on words right now, but essentially Alexander the Great, the one whose who's, like, cap had two horns in it. Those, both of them are mentioned in, in Surah Al-Kahf. And what's significant is when they came back to the Prophet ﷺ and they were so used to bringing challenges to the Prophet ﷺ and the Qur'an responding. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I will answer you tomorrow. But he didn't say, inshallah. And the revelation didn't come until 15 days later. And every day they'd come to the Prophet ﷺ and be like, oh, you don't have an answer for us. And part of it was to show that even the Prophet ﷺ himself didn't control Allah's revelation. Neither did the disbelievers. They have no right to demand anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet ﷺ that if you say, I will, in ayah number 23, if you say, I will do anything tomorrow, then say, inshallah, and remember your Lord if you forget. It also mentions the story of uh there are two people and there's so many lessons that there they talk about the the test of knowledge and this was the story of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam with Khidr 
how there's the test of wealth. There were the two men, one of them that had extreme amounts of wealth. And he said, clearly Allah loves me. And if there is an afterlife, even though I'm saying there isn't one, I'm somehow going to succeed there too. Um, the other test was the test of, um, I'm blanking out. The test of youth. And those were the, the people of the cave that left. And the last one was the test of power, and that is mentioned in the Qarnayn of how, how you can use your power for something that is good. Those are just two quick overviews of the surah. They're two very beautiful surahs. Please recite them as often as possible. If you would like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org. classes if you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.